All right, good evening, everyone. It is 6 p.m. on November 15, 2022, and I'm going to call this meeting to order for the City of Iowa City and roll call, please. Alter? Here. Burgess? Here. Harmson? Here. Taylor? Here. Teague? Here. Thomas? Weiner? Here. All right, and we didn't hear Mayor Alter. Yes, 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 oh, yes she did. Okay, great. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure people knew that Mayor Alter, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Alter, is joining us uh, virtually today. And Councilor Thomas, John Thomas, will not be with us. All right. We're going to move on to item number two, proclamations 2A, the Human Rights Day. And this is going to be read by Councilor Burgess. Whereas on December 10th, 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. And whereas <coughs> the Universal Declaration of Human Rights Day proclaims the inalienable rights which everyone is inherently entitled to as a human being, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, language, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status, and whereas at the end of 2021, the total number of people worldwide who were forced to flee their homes due to conflicts, violence, fear of persecution, and human rights violations was 89.3 million. And whereas if ongoing conflicts remain unresolved and the risk of new ones erupting are not reined in, one aspect that will define the 21st century will be the continuously growing numbers of people forced to flee and the increasingly dire options available to them. And whereas the number of refugees and forcibly displaced people has swelled to nearly 100 million worldwide, mostly women and children. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees works every day to aid these victims of war, famine, and oppression, and whereas the Johnson County United Nations Association, the city's Office of Equity and Human Rights, the Iowa City Public Library, and the Refugee and Immigrant Association will observe Human Rights Day on Tuesday, December 6th at 7 p.m. in meeting room A of the Iowa City Public Library with a panel of refugees now living in Iowa and a representative of UNHCR to discuss refugee rights and how UNHCR helps to protect those rights. Now I, on behalf of Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim December 10th, 2022 to be Human Rights Day in Iowa City and encourage community members to celebrate universal human rights and promote the value of human rights in our city and state in order to create awareness, education, and an environment of respect and connection for all community members. And to accept this proclamation is the president of the Johnson County Chapter of the United Nations Association, Barbara Eckstein. And we welcome you to give some words. Yep. Well, uh, I want to say again how grateful I am to the city for partnering with us again on an event. Uh, we appreciate the public library support and always the support of the city's Equity and Human Rights Commission. Thank, Thank you. you. 2B is Transgender Day of Remembrance, and this will be read by Councillor Weiner. So I actually asked to read this because uh, it seems of particular importance given some of the hostility at the state level uh, right now. So whereas Transgender Day of Remembrance is an annual observance on November 20th that honors the memory of the transgender people whose lives were lost in acts of anti-transgender violence. And whereas in 1999, Transgender Day of Remembrance was founded in order to memorialize the murder of Rita Hester, a transgender woman. And whereas the Human Rights Campaign tracks annual statistics of violence against people in the transgender community. The latest statistics currently available for 2022 report over 30 transgender or gender nonconforming people fatally shot or killed by other violent means in the US. A disproportionately high number of victims are black and Latinx transgender women. 
And whereas Transgender Day of Remembrance is an opportunity to look forward to the future and recommit to ending discrimination and transphobia by amplifying the visibility and voices of the transgender community. And whereas you can commemorate Transgender Day of Remembrance by attending and or organizing a vigil on November 20th to honor all those transgender people whose lives were lost to anti-transgender violence and learn about the violence affecting the transgender community. Now, therefore, I, Janice Weiner, on behalf of Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim November 20th, 2022, to be Transgender Day of Remembrance in Iowa City. The transgender pride flag will be hung at City Hall from Wednesday, November 16th through Monday, November 21st. And accepting this, uh, this proclamation will be Human Rights Commissioner Doug Kolash. Thank you. Um, my name is Doug Kolash. I'm in the Human Rights Commission, pronouns he, him. And on behalf of the Iowa City Human Rights Commission, I accept this proclamation and wish to extend our sincere gratitude to City Council for recognizing the Transgender Day of Remembrance. On November 20th, we mourn the transgender Americans we lost this year, as well as the countless other transgender people around the world, disproportionately black and brown transgender women and girls as the result of brutal violence, discrimination, and harassment. These victims, like all of us, are loving partners, family members, friends, and community members. They worked, they went to school, they attended houses of worship. They were real people, people who did not deserve to have their lives taken from them. We have seen a significant increase in anti-trans laws and rhetoric from political readers, leaders across the country, and Iowa is not immune to this tragic and despicable wave of hatred. These so-called leaders have taken aim at transgender children, a group that is already marginalized, a group that is already struggling. Transgender children and LGBT children as a group are much more likely to commit suicide than their peers. The American Academy of Pediatrics reports that more than half of transgender male teens attempt suicide in their lifetime, while one in three transgender female teens said they had attempted suicide. These are students who are struggling to find a place to belong in their school, and instead of being supported and allowed to participate freely, they've been told they are not welcome or worthy of playing sports with their peers. The anti-trans rhetoric has pervaded the public discourse and it seeks to dehumanize and demonize our transgender friends and neighbors. The words and attitudes of political leaders have the chilling effect of fomenting and encouraging violence against transgender members of our community. When members of the LGBTQ community are called groomers or pedophiles or any number of homophobic and transphobic slurs, it gives credence to hatred and lights the fuse of violence. In the recent election cycle, we have even seen examples of this dangerous speech in our own community of Iowa City. Therefore, I once again wish to thank the members of the City Council for issuing this proclamation in remembrance of the victims of transgender violence. Let it be clear that in Iowa City, we acknowledge and affirm this immutable truth, that trans men are men, transgender women are women, and that all humans have the right to freedom, justice, and joy. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 2C is USS Iowa SSN 797 Summer Marine Day, and this proclamation will be read by Councillor Taylor. Whereas the state of Iowa has a rich history of supporting the U.S. armed forces and the residents of Iowa have answered the call to serve our nation since 1846, and whereas the U.S. Navy has designated the 24th ship of the Virginia class attack submarine to be named USS Iowa SSN 797. And whereas this warship will continue to build upon the proud legacy of the rich history of the previous three warships named Iowa, BB-4, BB-53, and most recently BB-61, the big stick. And whereas USS Iowa SSN 797 
is currently under construction in Groton, Connecticut, with an estimated commissioning date of summer of 2023. And whereas the USS Iowa will be the first nuclear powered submarine purposefully built to accommodate both female enlisted and officer crew members. And whereas this warship will be in service for over 30 years, serving our country and representing the great state of Iowa. And whereas the commissioning committee of the USS Iowa seeks to bring recognition to the crew and the vessel and strive to establish a connection between the vessel and the residents of Iowa. Now, therefore, I, Pauline Taylor, on behalf of Bruce Teague, mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim November 15th, 2022, to be USS Iowa SSN 797 Submarine Day. And we very proudly say accepting is United States Navy veteran Caleb Schneider. Caleb, come up. First of all, I'd like to thank you all, uh, Mayor Teague, especially. Uh, this means a lot to me as a, an Iowa City native, grew up here uh, pretty much my whole life until I left for the Navy back in 2012. Uh, moved back to the state last year with my family and uh, live just down the road now in Tiffin. So uh, thank you all. Uh, being a submarine veteran with Veterans Day just behind us, uh, this is a special moment. and. Uh, with the USS Iowa being the first submarine named after our state, and as was stated, the fourth uh, naval vessel named after our state, I think this is a very unique thing for us. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that this is the first, or first and last submarine that we will see named after our state, uh, for our lives at least. And uh, I think it really represents Iowa well by, uh, they really had to do some re-engineering of the, of the ship to accommodate the, uh, the male and female crews for both officer and enlisted crew members. So I think, I think that really represents our state and I'm, I'm proud to be uh, uh, an executive director of the commissioning committee. Um, so thank you very much and uh, have a great night. Thank you. We will um, move on to items three through seven, which is our consent agenda. Could I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved, Weiner. Second, Taylor. All right, moved by Weiner, seconded by Taylor. Anyone from the public like to discuss this topic? please uh, step up to the podium. If you are online, uh, please raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you. Seeing no one, council discussion. I just uh, very quickly, oh, sorry, like to comment on 6H, uh, the Willow Creek stabilization, since that's in my neighborhood there. Uh, Benton Street is a very busy street and walkway, and the creek is very visible from the street and the walkway. So I'd been watching the progress uh, of this stabilization, and, and I have to admit, the erosion had been getting really bad along there, and tree stumps and just wasting away. And, and uh, so I was very impressed, and, and uh, uh, I'm pleased with the results. And I, I just wanted to re <clears throat> refer to item 6B, which is the formal appointment of our, our um, uh, undergraduate student government uh, liaisons, w who really always bring um, tremendous value added and connect this community, the, the sort of town and gown, the town with the university community. Great. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Burgess? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item number eight is community comment. This is an opportunity for anyone to speak on an item that is not on our agenda. Um, if you are present, we ask that you step to the podium. There is a sign-in sheet at the podium, and there are also stickers in the back of the room. For anyone online that wishes to comment, please raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you. Seeing no one, we're gonna move on. Oh, sorry, there is a hand raised online. Welcome, F.J. Piper. Please state your name and the city you're from. Hi, my name's Felicia Piper, I live in Iowa City. Welcome. I 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to speak about our homelessness services um, in the city of Iowa City um, or lack thereof. Um, I'm increasingly concerned that uh, I have still not heard about a winter shelter being open now that there's snow on the ground. Um, I would also like to um, just speak a little bit more on um, one story of one person who is experiencing homelessness who has been um, in the shelter house system now for um, several months um, through multiple programs and not receiving um, the services that are described. Um, there is a lack of accountability and transparency um, around our homelessness services. And I would like to know what the city is doing to fill the gaps um, for our neighbors and residents that need those services and they're not getting them. Um, I'd like to speak more on um, one person's um, story who started off um, by reaching out to Shelter House for uh, eviction prevention services, moved through that process um, really by herself without receiving those services. Um, she has then transitioned into the rapid rehousing services and um, the permanent housing services. Um, this has been going on for several weeks. And while I understand the barriers to receiving these services and the fact that they are um, uh, I guess just like not readily accessible, like I am sympathetic to that, that there are rules to follow. Um, but I think that the way that um, staff will um, are not accountable to making sure that they're being in contact with the people that they are serving. Um, I find this problematic for many reasons, but one reason being that our homeless neighbors are some of the most vulnerable neighbors um, and that it seems like someone needs an advocate, multiple advocates to even be able to receive the services that are offered through Shelter House. Um, I would like to see the city make tangible steps to creating accountability processes um, and also transparency among those services. And once again, considering that our unhoused neighbors are some of the most vulnerable, um, how are we ensuring that um, those folks are getting connected and being treated with dignity? Um, and I would like the city to take some ownership over this and make sure that the accountability um, is there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Seeing no one, we're gonna move on to item number nine, which is planning and zoning matters. 9A, rezoning 937 East Davenport Street. Ordinance rezoning property located at 937 East Davenport Street from medium density single family residential zone to medium density single family residential zone with a historic district overlay, and this is second consideration and staff is requesting expedited action. I move that the rule requiring that ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Taylor. Anyone from the public like to discuss this topic? If so, please step forward or raise your hand online. Council discussion? I'm very much in favor of this, so pleased to see this, and I applaud the owners of uh, this property uh, for seeing the historical value uh, of this home and wanting to preserve it. Uh, it's not a style we see these days, obviously, but it reminds me of the, the tiny homes that I envision for this city, so I, I'm very much in favor of this. It's always good to see the owners, as you mentioned, just be on board with this because um, Sometimes that's not the situation which we respect uh, anyone's uh, opinion and choice, but this is a great opportunity and we're, uh, I'm excited to see this. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Could I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved. Second. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Taylor. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? 
Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item 10 is Sidewalk Cafe's Expand Locations. Ordinance amending Title 10 entitled Public Ways and Property. Chapter 3 entitled Commercial Use of Sidewalks to Ally Sidewalk Cafes Outside of the Downtown and Riverside Crossings. Uh, can I get a motion to give first consideration? So moved, Burgess. Second, Weiner. All right, we're going to welcome Rachel. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, so currently the sidewalk cafes uh, are only allowed in the downtown and riverfront crossings uh, zones. So this ordinance amendment would allow sidewalk cafes without a liquor license to operate uh, outside of those districts. The cafes would be required to still abide by uh, our sidewalk cafe uh, ordinance and uh, policy, as well as any other additional restrictions um, that staff or the city manager uh, may see fit. So example, if you have a coffee shop operating in maybe a re more residential neighborhood uh, maybe the hours of operation need to be reduced that kind of thing um, so as you'll re recall at your September 6 work session you discussed several other uh, recommended changes to our sidewalk cafe program this is the only one that requires an ordinance change so that first reading is before you now um, our sidewalk cafe programs governed by both ordinance and policy so uh, the other recommendations will be brought to you uh, as a policy amendment at your next meeting on December 6 great any questions for Rachel? Thank you. Anyone from the public like to discuss this topic? If so, please uh, come forth. There is no one online presently. Seeing no one, council discussion. Roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item number 11 is land acknowledgement statement. Resolution adopting a land acknowledgement recognizing indigenous peoples and their traditional territories on which we live. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved, Alter. Second, Burgess. Anyone from the public like to discuss this topic? Seeing no one, council discussion. The, the first few years of my life, I, I lived in a small town in Wyoming uh, where indigenous people lived, worked, and were all around us. Uh, and they were even celebrated on several times throughout the year. Uh, so when my family moved to Iowa, uh, which had cities, counties, and rivers uh, with Native American names, I was surprised uh, that there was hardly any mention of their heritage. Uh, in fact, they, they lived on uh, reservations and were totally separate from most of us. So thank you, Councillor Weiner, uh, for putting this before us uh, to recognize the contributions made uh, to our land by the indigenous people. Thank you. It just uh, we it had been recommended by at least two of our commissions that we that we um, produce a land acknowledgement statement, um, drew on basically material that was already present at the at the university from the Native American Council as well as the law school. It just seemed to me, as as you said, that it was long past time that we honor those on whose land we live and thrive, and that that it's an essential part of our history. Uh, and I think that if we've learned anything over the past few years, that it should be that we must learn from, accept, and acknowledge our past and allow it to inform our present and our future. Roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item number 12 is filling council vacancy by spe special election. Resolution set in the special election to fill the council vacancy created by Janice Weiner's resignation. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, okay. Burgess. <laughs> Second, Second Alter. All right, moved by Burgess, seconded by Alter. She was louder than you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're going to welcome our city attorney, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so hopefully you've all had a chance to review uh, the staff memo that uh, came out on this topic. Um, as you will recall, there are two methods uh, by which you'll need to fill the council vacancy that'll be created um, upon uh, Councilor Weiner's uh, resignation, the effective date for which is the end of this calendar year. Uh, the first is to appoint 
a replacement. The second is to call a special election to elect a, a replacement for Councilor Weiner. As a result, uh, there are two competing resolutions on your agenda tonight. They are numbered items 12 and 13, respectively. One says that you'll choose uh, to fill the vacancy via an appointment. Uh, the other says you uh, choose to fill it by special election. So obviously you will need to, or you will want to uh, vote in favor of one and to reject the other. This is a zero sum game, only one of those can be the winner. <laughs> um, as I've shared with uh, Councilor Weiner and the rest of you, because Councilor Weiner remains a seated member of council, through the end of this calendar year uh, and has no legal conflict from participating in these discussions, uh, she's free to take part in this discussion and, and vote, as she does with any and all other votes until the effective date of her resignation at the end of this year. Um, while, to be clear, while Councilor Weiner uh, may take part in determining the method by which this council will decide how to fill that vacancy, uh, because uh, this council cannot appoint a replacement if council decides to appoint until the uh, vacancy actually occurs, she will not be in a position to vote for the specific individual uh, who uh, will fill her shoes. Um, so your task tonight is merely to determine uh, how you wish to fill the vacancy by special election or by appointment. Uh, obviously, I'm happy here to answer uh, your questions as they relate to election costs or how we did it last time, um, any, or any other questions that you can think of, at least to the best of my ability, given how rarely this uh, happens. Eric, this is Megan. I have a question, and it may sound naive <clears throat> even though we have two um separate agenda items we can discuss them as you know sort of in play with one another in order to be able to make a decision correct we don't have to sort of like go through the first agenda item uh, i just i'm i want to make sure that we're not hamstringing ourselves we'll be able to discuss both the pros and the cons of appointment and special election at the same time, correct? Even though we just end up with one decision. Right, a, a fair question okay. and you're absolutely right. You can have a full-fledged discussion for the first agenda item and they come in order and, and I should be clear, no particular order. Uh, the order uh, is number 12, it's by special election. So yes, you as a council should have a full discussion about whether you wish to have special election or appointment and then and then vote on this and well, and then vote on the second one. And as I said, okay. hopefully one of those will pass and the other does not. Thank you. All right, council discussion. Personally, I'm not in favor of having a special election to fill the vacancy. I, I think that comes with from you, you did. Thank you, Eric. You did share some of the statistics on, on the cost. Uh, thanks also to the auditor's office. But uh, it's a hefty price tag and a lot of time and a lot of staff effort. And uh, I just uh, would say no to special election. When we first started. Oh, <clears throat> sorry, Megan, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you go ahead, Laura. I was just going to reflect on when we first n knew this would be likely, I guess, when uh, um, Janice announced her candidacy. Um, at the time, I was very much like, Iowa City has no option but an election, right? Like, there's there's no way that Iowa City would stand for appointment of a, of a city councilor. Um, and then I went and looked at the, um, saw what Coralville did, for one, but also knowing that the, the school district made an appointment, and went and looked up some statistics on special city council elections in Johnson County in the last several years. So the last, I believe the last Iowa City one was 2018. Is that right, Eric? That's correct. And so at that point, 9% of our registered voters participated in that election. And in uh, 2019, the next year in North Liberty, they had a special city council election that was 7% of the registered voters. 2020 in Coralville was better, 13.8% of the registered voters. Tiffin in 2020 had a special city council election, 4.48% percent of the registered voters and just this year in North Liberty they had a special city council election with 1.9 percent wow. of the registered voters participating. So all of those statistics are just to say not very many people participate 
and we know that the timeline for a special election would be very short and that a campaign, all of us up here have gone through a campaign of one type or another, um, takes a lot of effort, a lot of energy. It can take a lot of money, a lot of stress. And from an equity standpoint, I think a low barrier application that is open to everyone with us having the opportunity to speak with individuals who would be interested um, is actually a better process for making it open to those who might be um, wanting and capable of serving than having a very, very low turnout, short time frame special election. So I've moved, in my opinion, to, to favoring appointment. I think this is one that I've really, um, really still kind of struggle with because on principle, I think, you know, I'm totally in favor of having the people um, have a voice in this decision and having, you know, help with other of these short term campaigns. Um, I like how it can um, opens things up a little bit more um, to somebody out there who might be able to field a campaign and, and can jump in and and uh, you know this body here has uh, benefited from the outcomes of special um, elections and we've had some some good results with that. Um, I don't feel particularly a lot of um, uh, a lot of problem with the financial cost of a campaign because I think just just democracy is worth it. All of those things said. Um, I definitely can see the point of um, this is only going to be a year term versus a longer period of time. Um, if we do run an election, um, special election, quite probably this new person wouldn't be on until we are th through or almost through the budget process, which was one of the things that I was originally concerned about. You know, we're talking about the, the you know the amount of money to run an election versus the um, the the amount of the budget that we make decisions on, but somebody who comes in through a special election wouldn't really be part of that, pro would just wouldn't be here in time for that process. So, so I'm still waffling back and forth a little bit on this, but, um, <coughs> but those are the things that I've been sort of weighing out in my head as I do so. Well, it may seem a little bit odd for me to speak on this. That, that I guess the thing that, that's, that I've been thinking about is you refer to democracy. Um, and, I, and I've ended up wondering, I mean, I remember when when Councillor Burgess and I were first elected, the press came to us, and one of the things I said, it's, it's really great, but I really wish we had more than 15 or 16 percent turnout or whatever it was. We need more. This local, elect, local government affects you, and it would be really helpful if more people would turn out to vote. Um, and so when I, when I look at the possibility of a special election and really low turnout, it seems almost anti-democratic, um, and, that, and that's sort of my my concern. Well, certainly I can see that in the time of year we're discussing, too. Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem Alter. Yeah, um, I'm very much like uh, Councilor Burgess in that I started off thinking, and, and you and I have talked about it, Mayor, about like, well, of course, Iowa City just does special elections. But I, too, started to think about it. And um, th there are several things that uh, just sway me towards an appointment. Um, for one, it's not even a year's appointment by the time the person comes on. Uh, it's roughly nine months. Um, Coralville, Iowa City School District, and the League of Cities um, have, sorry, the, the former two conducted appointments, and then the League of Cities and the memo that we saw from Eric shows that that's sort of the, the um, majority way that, that many cities have conducted their business as well. Um, for what that's worth. Uh, Sean, you, you talked about the timing of it um, as well as others. I think February is, that's that's a brutal time of year for people to get out. Um, and we have just come off of a, a grueling midterm cycle. And I think that people are very tired. I, don't, I think that that too is going to depress turnout. Um, ultimately, what sways me the most is that if, in fact, we go the route of a, um, an appointment, the public can speak and say that they want a special election. They just have to petition it. So it's not that we're cutting out the possibility of one. If people feel very strongly otherwise, the people can speak. And I think that, that that's the great thing about the way that this has been written. Um, so I feel OK with um, putting forth an appointment uh, an RFP, if you will, <laughs> um, you know, for people to to apply. 
um, I very much would like to be able to to talk with candidates um, as well. But that's kind of my thinking and where I'm leaning at this point. So I appreciate all of the comments so far about uh, do we do special election? Do we appoint <clears throat> just like everyone? I've you know kind of gone through that process of <laughs> This is Iowa City. They will never allow a special election. Or, I mean, they will never allow an appointment. And so I started there and um, where we have to go to a special election. And as things began to unfold, many of the things that uh, people processed here, um, I did determine that an appointment would be in the best centers of this of the city. Um, I've had many conversations with people in the community saying, "Hey, what are your thoughts? What, you know, what are you thinking here?" And surprisingly, some of the um, some of the political faces of those that are you know very prevalent uh, when it comes down to elections, many of them uh, kind of said, "You know, I, I can be open to either," uh, which was a little surprising. Um, the timeline that many of you talked about um, is going to be short if we go to a special election. Um, we're, you know, looking at not appointing someone, I mean, not having someone in that seat for, um, you know, some time. And then if we do an appointment, um, we'll have to talk about the, you know, when do we want to end the application process. Um, I'm looking at how we typically do our uh, our commissions, um, so it like vacancies new on our agenda for today. That application closes Tuesday, January 3rd. Um, and so I would say that we would have an application process that would end no later than, uh, no earlier than January 3rd would be my proposal. Um, and then if we are to go also with that appointment route, um, the question would be is, you know, what does that um, application look like for those that are interested? And also, um, how do we make sure that, as Councillor uh, Berg has talked about, um, keeping the barriers low, more of a, um, um, how, how do we make sure that we ensure that we're asking, you know, some pertinent questions, but also making sure that it's equitable uh, to everyone in the community? Um, that is interested in this opportunity. So I will be supporting uh, the appointment route. Um, and then I think at some point we have to have a little more of the logistical conversations um, about how do we make that happen. Yeah, Any other comments on this one? Actually, I was going to say with, with, that, with that approach, do we have an idea for like how long it would take to put out an actual, like would that be something we'd prepare and then vote on the announcement, the job posting, if you will, at our, at our next meeting, and then can we even do that while there's still a vacancy? Like, when can we actually start that process? Oh, yeah, we can start the process now. And so if you want to spend some time and, uh, or if you want to give some guidance to staff and we can present a draft, uh, perhaps for your December 6th meeting, uh, that'd be fine. Uh, based on your remaining meeting schedule for uh, this year, I think it would probably be, if council wants to provide input uh, or to approve the uh, application uh, form or any other part of the application process, we would probably need to have that from you uh, by December 6th or uh, to have you vote on it uh, on December 6th. I appreciate the application forms that you shared with us that the that Corville utilized the school district and of course there are a lot of things that would need to be tweaked a bit but otherwise the format was you know what I think uh, we could utilize and, and would be helpful. And would we also have to set up now or, or decide when we finally make this decision on the timing for like are we going to set up a process that involves like a, a two stage um, application then interviews and then time frame for that. I mean, I'm just wondering about some of those logistics that the mayor was talking about, just if we've, what that might look like. I know some, I think some of this was in the memo, but I don't know if all of it was. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that, I mean, I'm hearing the consensus is to uh, appoint, and if that's uh, the case and you'll want to decide on an application process, that's the form, that's the process itself, that is, I, would you folks want interviews? Would you just be doing it based on, you know, what you see in the application and or, you know, letters of reference, uh, you know, whatever uh, you're interested in as a council? Um, and then it would, again, be best if we nail that all down by December 6th. Um, so if it's up to you if you want to have some discussion about kind of your desires in that regard tonight <coughs> That would give staff some direction and and again, we can present something to you that you can react to um, And then we can you know make changes on the fly at the meeting on the 6th if that's your um, if you want to make any um, But then we'd have the process nailed down and then um, the city clerk and, and I can you know make sure we get the notices uh, published and so forth uh, consistent with the state law and all the other requirements that are uh, there in at state code. I, th I think the examples that you gave us um, were really good at other cities and their application. Um, and then we already have an application process that we use for our commissions. And so I would, you know, propose that we either look at that right now in real time, look at our current commission application and maybe decipher what we don't think is necessary for a council appointment. Uh, we know that the gender requirement is a state requirement for people to, you know, answer that. Um, and so I think we can remove things that are not, you know, that aren't required. To be clear, Mayor, the the gender balance and so forth is for board and commissioners. Maybe that's what you're saying already. Yes, that would yes. not be required. For, yeah. Okay. No, that would not be required. Yeah. But it is required for our commission applications. Right. And so, um, I, and then if if that is the case, if if we want to, you know, go that route, at starting, you know, there. When I look at the city of Corville's, um, the information that they ask is what we ask for the most part within our commissioners. Um, our application is just very long because we have some, <laughs> we spell out a few things, um, an explanation of like, tell us if you're on a city commission before, you know, that type of stuff. So, um, and, and maybe we don't want to know that information unless they naturally say that they've been on a, you know, on a, on a, um, like for instance, uh, Coralville, you know, talks about um, experience and or activities which you feel qualify you for the city council. So maybe there are some tweaks that we can make um, somewhat on the fly. Um, and we can use what we already have as a standard. And then the question would be, is if we do make this determination, how quick can the city clerk office uh, post <laughs> whatever edits, you know. Are you wanting this to be online? I think it should be online. I don't know how else we can make that possible to. Is it possible, sorry, is it possible actually to have paper copies that people, if they were interested, that could come get one at City Hall as well? We certainly could. I mean, that's how we do it with boards and commission. There's, you know, right. Yeah. Both. Yeah. I just didn't know if they wanted it online also. I just don't know as far as IT. I'm assuming if it's easy tweaks from the application we already have, that it wouldn't take them a lot of time to do. Yeah, I, I like what you where you were going with that, Mayor, and I just pulled up the our current application. I think the experience and or activities which you feel qualify you for this position is an excellent prompt. Um, the present knowledge of the council, I think is also a good, <laughs> good question. Um, I defer to Eric, but I think including something relating to conflicts of interest might be helpful, necessary. Well, it, you, yeah, I mean, again, since this is a, a purely political decision for council to make insofar as uh, who this person would be, and if they have conflicts that are gonna create problems, then that's a fair question, and it'd be good for you to know. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then I, I guess my, my biggest question is if we're not, I, I really like 
for commission appointments when we have the demographic information. But that is like a, a bit of a double-edged sword as well. So I don't know how people feel about requiring, well, not requiring it, but having it like we do on the commission application where it's optional, but, you know, people can answer those so, those such questions. Such as age and race and those yeah. kinds of things. Yep. Mm -hmm. If we can ex expand it um, to non-binary and, you know, and just be a little more um, inclusive, I, I would be okay with that. So then the question would be, um, anything else? Okay. So I guess the, the question would be is if this council is comfortable based on the discussion today, if staff, and I know that uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Alter, and I, we meet with um, the city manager's office tomorrow, um, and we can also include uh, our attorney, Eric, if, if council is comfortable with us just kind of finalizing that discussion real quick tomorrow and so that um, staff could go forth and create the final document. Um, and if you all are comfortable, we can just uh, give it a thumbs up and, and send it out electronically and have copies, um, paper copies in the city clerk's office. I would be comfortable with that. All right, so seeing majority of hit not. I think we still have to vote on the. Oh, we do? Yeah. Well, we have to vote on the item, but this yeah. is on, a helpful discussion. Yeah, no, 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 let me get the discussion. Yeah. I, I think we, you know, one thing, too, I would add with that, um, and just as a, so we've mentioned of, of using the, as a safeguard, um, the ability of people to, the, the public to gather signatures, just so that we make sure this process that, that we are, like, making sure people know the time windows for that, their, their availability to do such a thing. Um, because it is a little bit from the memo, mem memo. It's a little bit confusing. There's like two stages, I think, to that, and yeah. and just just to make sure that in the interest of if we're going to do an appointment, that we are making sure our community, if they think this is an unwise decision, they know what they need to do to. Yeah, Eric, our yeah. would so. would we publish that in the newspaper or just in on our web page? Right. So if if the council decides to make an appointment and so forth, then we have to publish notice, and that's <coughs> one of the state law requirements. And part of that, an element of that, is to point out the uh, you know the community's right to, to file that petition and so forth. Exactly what you're addressing. Yeah. All right. Then. So I think the sooner we decide these details, the sooner that publication would occur. Uh, well. Yes and no. There's uh, a window in which we need to publish, and uh, that's between four and 20 days before the oh, right. actual appointment. Okay. And I targeted January, the January 10th meeting <clears throat> uh, for council. Um, I, I figured maybe at your budget meeting was maybe not the time when you wanted to do this. Uh, correct me if, if that was in, not right. Uh, but the next meeting is the January 10th meeting, and so we would need to track back between, you know, the publication would have to be, you know, no fewer than four days, no more than 20 days before January 10th. Gotcha. What do people think about interviewing versus evaluating them like we do commission applications or putting the onus on us to contact people who we want to speak with? How do we want to do that? Question. Do we want to do, depending on the number of applications, do it like uh, stages, like, you know, try and, by looking at applications, narrow it down to a smaller number, and then, mm -hmm. I think then at that point, group interviews would probably be more efficient than somebody trying to answer seven different phone calls or, you know what I mean? I'm just mm -hmm. in terms of. Oh, or maybe that's not not the way, but that's just my first thought. Eric, with that, those would have. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, if we were to do it as a group interview, those would have to be open meetings, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 And right. I, I think that's how Corval did it. Not that that means that's how you have to do it, but uh, that would be my recommendation: is that you folks do it as a group, as a whole council. Yeah. I, I did see, in no disrespect to um, Coralville, I did see that process. Um, and I think there was great value there. Um, but I'll, as I look at what we do now for our commission, for our, you know, um, commission selections, um, there are some commissions where, you know, we're all in and we're, you know, people are contacting us, having those one-on-one -on -one discussions, or we're contacting individuals. Um, 
I think, you know, we can, you know, bring people into a meeting and have them each, you know, give their comments. But personally, I, I think I would find it more um, advantageous for me to uh, talk one-on-one -on -one with individuals and, um, and then we come back and we make our selections that way. But that's just me. And I, I do understand the, you know, it won't be public, right, that I'm having these one-on-one -on -one conversations, but... Who um, cares about the public? So, we don't care about the public so here. I, I wonder if that's even something we have to nail down the no, actual... We don't crap about public opinion here. Well, I, 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 We've nailed I, I, down yeah. that no, level right, of detail right. at this point, so... I think it's um, a good point, though, Mayor, because, um, like, during the normal process, special or regular election process, we hear from the candidates and we hear what their priorities are. And that's one thing that wouldn't be on that commission application is what do you see as your priorities? And that might be something we might want to add on there so that we know if, if affordable housing is their priority or, or yeah. transit or, or what it might be. So we kind of know where they're coming the from. I think we can have both and. <laughs> so we could potentially um, have, as you were talking, I heard um, um, more like that um, when we were all, camp, you know, going for our candidacy, we sat in a forum, mm -hmm. you know, and we all get, had three minutes of whatever. Mm -hmm. um, what I what I would suggest is that maybe we have uh, people come up for three to five minutes that apply, okay. and they just share whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And you threaten to remove me by force. What about the, the question of winnowing, like you were saying, mm -hmm. Sean? You know, if we get a hundred applications, <laughs> um, are we committed to three minutes for each person? Because um, obviously any selection to get to the top 10 or some, or who knows, it would I, have to be public as well. Mm -hmm. Megan, go ahead. I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of winnowing, um, you know, to, to get to kind of, um, you know, a, a manageable number um, that honestly is respectful of everyone's time, including the candidates, right, or the applicants. Um, if someone does it on a whim and but really is sort of like, wow, I didn't expect I was going to have to talk about this, I, you know. I, on the one hand, I don't want to make assumptions for anybody if they've applied. They're serious about it, but um, ultimately, if we have a lot of people applying, I think there does it. it just makes sense um, to me um, to 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 get it down to a manageable number. I think in some regards that's mirroring the way a primary works. It's mirroring certainly how it works for job interviews. Um, so I don't think that we're really doing anything unusual by approaching it in that way. Would that be just two different consecutive meetings then? Like a public uh, one meeting to say, this is our top five, and then another one that we would have uh, but I missed part of what you said, but three to five minutes where they would like a forum with forum where, where they, they would tell have what their priorities our, are. Our, like, right. Yeah. You know, and if by some reason we get five or less or whatever that number is, less applications, then we don't need a first round meeting. We could always cancel a meeting maybe if you know, I don't know how that would Well sure, that's my question. I mean I'm assuming that the winning would be done by the whole council as opposed to well, anyone I think else. So. Yeah. Um, and then that could be done any number of ways. I mean if you I mean, it's kind of a matter of time, man your time management. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. you could do that at the meeting on the 7th if you all just came in with these are my five candidates. We're just gonna, you know, see from each of you, you know, who your five are and add them up and whoever, you know, the five candidates are with the most votes is the ones, or are the ones that'll be interviewed by the council um, on the t uh, 10th. Or you could have a special meeting and have a, you know, broader discussion or a lengthier discussion about it. Or you can have a lengthier discussion on the seventh if you'd want. But uh, I'm guessing that um, you, neither you nor staff probably want to do that. For that will already be a long meeting. Um, but yeah, um, scheduling a special meeting, whatever you want to do. Or it doesn't have to be the tenth. Like I said, that's I, I picked that rather arbitrarily, figuring it would be the earliest one, and you'd want that person to be as involved in the budget process as they can be. But you know, we could schedule it out if if that's the uh, process you folks chose. Could we reverse engineer that just slightly and do the um, going through the narrowing down our applications if necessary on the tenth, and then having a special meeting like two days later to make a final decision? 
like have them in and, and speak? I mean, I'm just trying to sure. think of op options here. Maybe that spitballing a little bit. I think so. The seventh is our Saturday budget work session, right? I believe. I, yes. I think it's a Saturday, but um, but okay. yes. Kelly's saying yes. Okay. So if I trust Kelly. I mean, I I think what Eric was saying of if we have whatever it is our top ones and just you know. I think there's a high likelihood there will be a relative amount of consensus so that we'll be able to say, you know, these are the people who we want to say we would like to hear more from you. I really like the idea of setting that date, whether it's January 10th or another day. I like the 10th. That's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I like the idea of setting that, like, definitively as soon as possible so that anyone who's thinking about it would know that we're talking about having a process where they may, you know, want to come in and speak to us. Um, so yeah, I, I'd be in favor of kind of what Eric proposed that we have, you know, we just get them numbered or something like that. Um, if we can make that work timing wise, and then we just, like we did with strategic planning, we don't just- Carve 10 minutes our, out of the seventh and, or 15 minutes or whatever out of the seventh to do that part of the, is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. So um, if we have the applications do by the third, and we can even move it to the fifth if um, that week. Um, well, it, no, it would have to be tight, yes. Yeah. It would have to be by the fourth of Wednesday. I'd have to <laughs> let me try to think this through. Uh, well, are you thinking about the the publish notice issue or the how much time you folks have to consider and review the applications? Right. Both of those. <laughs> uh, in two days does not leave a lot of no uh, and that is true so i mean certainly we can go i mean when i went for special election it was literally about a month so right. well i mean just thinking back if if you would like to make the ultimate selection on the 10th and are willing to do the winnowing on the 7th then yeah, that's fine we could you know we could uh you know if we publish closer to 20 days before that would be you know december 20 21st something like that so I, I i think you would be fine i mean that would allow uh you know between let's say the 21st or 22nd and and it's not we don't have a f you know that's not as flexible as we would like it to be it happens to be whenever the press citizen does their legal notices um, but there would be at, at least a week in there, um, maybe a little more time if you made it due on uh, January 3rd. If you wanted to do it on January 5th, we could. That would not leave a lot of time to, um, for us to get you all the applications and for you to consider them before the 7th, but that's, that's kind of your decision as to how much time you think you'll need. Today's is tight. That's tight. That's tight. The third. I think the third is good. Do the third. Kelly, is that feasible for you and your staff? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Thank you. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. That was a good funny So joke. then, <laughs> okay. All right. And then 7th, we'll have, we'll come with our top numbers. Although, I mean, there's a, there's a chance that they're, you know, may not be more than seven people. Right, right. right. <laughs> so if, and so I don't know if we say, you know, if there's seven or more, you know, we will select. If not, I think we can certainly invite seven people yeah. for the council. Is, seven's a reasonable. Sure. Sounds good. And then allow everyone that opportunity at that point. All right. And then. Um, Everybody what? And then we'll have that meeting on the 10th. Allow everybody the opportunity okay. to and tell the, their story. And the publication, so just in thinking of this time frame, is right, when can the application be oh, live? Okay. I understand the publication, but like when, when can we actually start accepting applications? Oh, uh, I, I think your question is can we begin accepting the applications before the actual vacancy? Is Correct. Yes, I believe we can. Okay. Or before the publication? Before, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, 
before the publication and before the end of the calendar year. Oh, both, yes, both, yes. Both, okay. Right. Yeah, both. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's, it's the publication is just ensuring that folks who are getting their word of this through the publication, and let's concede that that's probably not very many of them, um, have that opportunity to still put in their application prior to the deadline, which we're saying is the 3rd. January 3rd. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. I have an important story. And if me up. yeah, if all right. Anything else? Uh, so just to to recap, maybe we can recap yeah, sure. what we're doing. Would you like me to try to spell out the chronology as as I understand it? Yes. That'd be okay. Great. So we'll publish a notice uh, around uh, uh, December twenty first. Again, depending on when. Uh, I don't know what day of the week that is. I mean, you know. Yeah. Well, we'll check with the press citizen, and it'll be. It'll be no earlier than the 21st. It'll be the first available date after on the 21st or after. Okay. Uh, and then applications will be due by January 3rd. If there are more than seven applicants, uh, we will do the you will do the winnowing um, <clears throat> at your meeting on the 7th, and then on the 10th you will make the final decision. Great. And prior to that. I think we've give, have we given enough input as far as what should be on the application so that you and Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor, can get that finalized and get it published as soon as possible? Not published in the newspaper, right. but put online and had copies available as sure. soon as possible? Well, here's my question. Would you like, uh, you know, your next meeting is on December 6th, and... Um, you know, maybe you feel like we've had enough discussion now and, and you've laid it out and we can certainly just go forward with it or you can approve kind of all of this in, a, in an item on the six, including the application itself. It's entirely up to you. If you want to get it out sooner, then, you know, there should just be a consensus that, you know, as, you, as the mayor indicated, that the mayor, the mayor pro tem, city manager, city clerk and city attorney will get together, finalize based on the input that you provided tonight and we'll put it out there so that folks can start applying. To answer your question, I think I feel confident confident that we'll be able to um, review and, and get an application that we know that this council would approve. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, I and, just wanted to clarify yeah. that. And was, then I think we get it out yep, as soon as, as soon possible. as possible. One other thing I would ask um, for council to consider is every Thursday, and I don't know how big of a deal this might be, but we. Um, upload any applicants that come in in our info packet. One, it'll give us opportunity to speak to anyone and give the public opportunity to know who is actually applying. Typically we wait for commissioners to all be published um, you know at one time when there's an opening um, so, in, for instance, if applications are due January 3rd, we wouldn't post until January 5th. So I think just to have it a little more transparent to the public, every Thursday in our info packet, as applications come through, we would just upload them um, in the info packet. Once they start coming in? As they start coming in, and then because we also want you know, opportunities for, I'm sure people will reach out if they're interested in being on this council. Uh, um, they'll reach out to each of us, but I think it'll just. Does, um, I do have one question. Does that in any way, uh, coming from like test taking background, so to speak, but does that disadvantage anyone um, who is brave and submits right away? Then others have an opportunity to be able to see what they've written. Um, and can oh. they're working off of a, you know they have they have a model in front of them that they can work from. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that you know negatively. It's just that you know if somebody's doing this and it's a blank slate, then others can see it and go, oh right, okay, I can do da 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 da. You know, it just it can jog a memory or what have you. I'm just wondering if that would unfairly disadvantage someone uh, who was brave. If if if. And I hear what you're saying, and I, I would agree. I Then I would suggest that we move it up just one week to December 27th that the applications are due, and then we'll have it will be posted Thursday the 29th, and that will give us, you know, 10 days, something like that. 
So, I mean, I, I don't even think. I mean, Nine days. That, that's fine. I was just going to say, too, um, uh, Megan, make, uh, council member Alter, makes a good point. Um, but, you know, if we were doing this as campaigns, it's the same dynamic. You know, if somebody were to launch a campaign, somebody else wants to launch a week later, they could see what the first. I mean, that's, I, I think that we're not in, a, in, in quite a, the same kind of testing situation. Um, you know, it's not that different. Um, so I'd, I'd be comfortable with either just like a week or two earlier starting to collect or, or whatever. But I think that's probably just the way that, that's the way this, this cookie crumbles, mm -hmm. I think. So mm -hmm. that makes a good, you make a really good point. Um, I, I think it's more like, I just want to, if anything, for us to be aware of it as we're thinking about it mm -hmm. and, well, and going through and vetting things. Though. So, um, yeah, no, I didn't mean it as like, okay, so we got to take that off the table just raising it for, for conversation. So, but I, I think you're right, Sean, it definitely makes sense. Like, you know, this is a campaign situation, just albeit in a different mode. So do we want to just push the deadline a week earlier and have more time to review them all? Or are we talking about doing sort of the rolling posting? Or maybe both. Here's here's my one concern about that. So as I mentioned, we're going to try to publish as close as we can to the 21st. I'm a little uncertain whether that'll be the 21st, the 22nd, or 23rd, something like that. And so you would want to leave some time. Um, and so I'm concerned if if you're talking about having the due date be the 27th, with the with of course the um, you know some holidays in between there. Um, that might not leave a lot of time for applicants, uh, but, but could, that's a political decision, not a legal one. We could publish on the seventh. Uh, we could. Uh, no, we could not. If, not if you wanted to appoint on the tenth, because it needs to be at least four days. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. See, this is why you're here. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. So January third. <laughs> January third. We're, <laughs> We're back to January third. So the question is rolling posting, right, or rolling dissemination of applicants versus all at once, right? So and I'm fine taking my my comment off the table. Rolling is fine. Uh, no, that, no, it was a great point. If that lends itself to the process that we've been talking about, that's fine by me. No, I think it was important to bring up so that we just acknowledged it. And, um, and I think... What Councillor Hermson said is it is like campaigning in a way, you know, people roll out whenever. And I think um, having as much um, transparency with the public as possible on these applicants is probably beneficial. Yeah. Why well, you guys hide yeah. all the stuff you're yeah. doing? So for Kelly's sake, is it cumulative? Like each week, it's everyone who's applied that gets stuck in the packet, or just new ones, or do you care? I think we keep it rolling where it's cumulative. Okay. Yeah, it's important that UNESCO knows who the applicants that, are. That seems a little easier for us to handle, yeah. Political repression. And maybe at the top. Um, From the top on down. Uh, yeah. Yep. I was going to say just their submission date, <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. Where you have, like, these are the applicants and the date they submit it. Any right. other? So what, uh, what I'm hearing is that we, I think we've got a timeline laid out. Um, we're going to defer to the mayor and mayor uh, pro tem and, and staff mm -hmm. for the application process. So I, at this point, I don't see any reason to bring it up again on the 6th unless there's anything that you folks think it remains unresolved. I, I think staff, I'm going to look at staff here, uh, I think we've got the information that we need. To vote. We still yeah. need to vote, and again, I'll remind council that the first item is to fill by special election, and the second item is for appointment. All right, so roll call for the special election. Alter. For special election? No. Special election, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I acknowledge your vote is no. Uh, Burgess? No. Harmson? No. Taylor? No. Teague? No. Weiner. No. Motion fell zero to six. Item number 13 is fill in council vacancy appointment. This is a resolution given notice of intent to make an appointment to fill the council vacancy created by Janice Weiner's resignation. Could I get a motion to approve? So moved, Burgess. Second, Taylor. All right. Any additional staff comments? 
Uh, not for me, thank you. All right. <laughs> Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Please state your name and city, and Joe there's Birdie, a sign Maringo, in. Joe Birdie, Marengo, Iowa. Joe Birdie, Marengo, Iowa. Welcome. Hi, how you doing? Hearing no further comments. I got three minutes. I got two and a half minutes left. Hearing no further comments, I also got, discussion. I got two and a half minutes left, Bruce. You can speak on this then item. Be quiet when I'm up on the stand then, please. Respect me for oh. once. Thank you. So this is filling a council vacancy appointment, and you're not talking about that item, and we're going to end your time now. Council discussion? Um, Mayor, just looking at what's in the packet of the notice. Okay, there's the resolution. All right. Sorry, I was trying to determine if we are actually approving the language of the notice, or do you... I believe the language I put in the resolution said something substantially similar or okay. something. We'll certainly make sure everything is compliant given our discussion this evening. Perfect. Okay. All right. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passed to six to zero. Item number 14 is council appointments. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. 14A is Board of Adjustment. Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term, January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2027. Uh, we uh, council discussion at this point. Um, so the Board of Adjustment has one vacancy with no gender balance required. At first, I was a little confused by this one uh, because one of the applicants, Mr. Baker, talked about that he wouldn't mind um, just filling it to bridge. And so I actually called him today uh, to see what he meant by that and whether he would be interested in doing a full term then. And, and he said, oh, yes, he would definitely be interested in doing a, a full term. That At the time of his application, I think that was when we were filling. Oh, you want One to second. To, okay. We're, we're in council meeting, and please. I'll see you at 6 in the morning. Please. I'll be sweeping the sidewalk in front of the cops. We are having You are the one that's being rude. And we'll have a I'm being rude. Yes. Please. How am, am I, how am I being rude? All right. We're going to continue with our council meeting I'm at this rude. point. Speaking over people and really? interrupting people. Well, yes. I didn't get my yes. three minutes now, did I? You didn't okay. speak. All right. That's all right. I, okay. Uh, yep. Councilor Taylor, anyway. you can continue. Okay. I will continue with what I was saying. I spoke to Mr. Baker. Uh, he's well known in the community and, and has, and has served a lot of uh, positions. Me. But um, apparently at the time when he filled this out in, not, in June, I believe, was there was an unexpected Tell vacancy. And he was willing to serve then for temporary, but we didn't utilize him. Uh, but I would no recommend uh, putting him in this term now because so he said he would do a full term. Okay. Be willing to. At the top of the chain of command. I'm comfortable with that. The Larry Baker. Does whatever wants. So Larry Baker is a um, is on the table for now. Any other she consideration? She don't care about any of I would go with Baker as well, although I could only hear part of it because there was a lot of yelling. All right. And I would support Baker, so we have majority of support there. So um, we'll go ahead and vote each one of these as we go. And so could I get a motion to appoint Larry Baker? So moved. Second. Moved by Taylor, seconded by Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to six to zero.
All right, on to 14B, Climate Action Commission. Climate Action Commission, there are three vacancies to fill three-year terms, January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2025, and this is council discussion. There is um, a, a gender balance requirement, and it's three females that we have to appoint. I just want to open it up and say that this was an extraordinary batch of applicants. Um, yeah. it, very difficult and we would be well served by all of them, honestly. So um, thank you to everybody who applied. Um, a couple of names that rose to my attention uh, were Elizabeth Fitzsimmons and Rebecca Nielsen. And um, there's a few others that I'll just put those two out as, as candidates that I think could really add um, <coughs> unique perspectives um, while fitting into a more cohesive whole for the, the Climate Action Committee. Commission. Is Climate Action uh, one, of the, one of the commissions that's open to uh, people outside of Iowa City? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I liked uh, Michelle Silman yeah. as well. I also liked Michelle Silman. Although I had had a question about her, Eric. Um, she mentioned working for that North American Energy Company, NG. Um, would there be any conflict of interest with that? I mean, we have a Mid American Energy person, so would would there be any problem with that? Right. Uh, I don't think so. Certainly, if any issue would come up that would address. Uh, her employer, she would need to recuse. She'd have to recuse uh, herself. But, okay. you know, much like we have a lot of people who work for the university, you know, I mean, that would be fine. We could work around that. And I liked her as well and had the same question, so it's nice to have that um, answered in the positive or negative. And Councillor Weiner, I believe you're the one that asked the question about uh, Iowa City requirement. Uh, it's recommended, but as long as you're in Johnson County, and I believe, which one is it? Who is it that's... Uh, it's Rebecca Nielsen, who works in emergency preparedness, lives in Tiffin. Oh, okay. And, but I, I, was looking, I think it was Jamie Gade lives in North Liberty. Mm -hmm. So there was North, a North Liberty person and a Tiffin person. And either one of those, I think, would be good. They might uh, provide a, an additional perspective to the commission. So either one of those would be good. So which names did you just give? I know you said yes, Michelle um, Silman. You agreed with. Uh, there was. Fitzsimmons, I think, was one of the Nielsen names. Nielsen and Jamie Gade, I think you said. And, and Jamie Gade. Jamie Gade okay. was the North Liberty person, and okay. And was it Nielsen was the Tiffin? Yeah, and then there's Michelle Silman. It's basically, Priscilla. four out of five of the women seem seem quite well qualified, at least. But now we have to pick three, right? right. Yes. What it's worth, just to, and again, we have an embarrassment of riches here. The reason why I was interested in Elizabeth Fitzsimmons is because she's younger, yep. honestly, and um, you know has is is graduating out of UI, and it just seemed to me that there was kind of like younger energy as well as a wealth of knowledge, and she has a lot with prairie conservation. So again, that's a kind of a different angle than some of the other candidates. Um, but again, each each brings strengths. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was kind of taken by the fact that she was younger, and it seems that, um, you know, the level of interest from generations that are just coming up now um, might be able to bring a certain something. Kind of on a similar note, one of the things that jumped out at me with uh, um, Jamie Gade's application was the um, her background in health outcomes. And I think that's, uh, to me, that just, I mean, they're, they all had good stuff in them. So it's, She's worked with but, that, but that one did sort of, sort of jump up at me a little bit. And I thought that might be an interesting part of the mix because I think that's, you know, obviously when we're talking about climate action and health outcomes and resiliency, it all sort of plays together. I mean, uh, okay. I, oh, go right ahead. Yeah, I would just, uh, the, what what would people think about Fitzsimmons, Gabe, Gade, and Nielsen? Yeah, that's kind of where I hear the majority leaning towards, and I can support those three. My number one was Michelle Silman. 
Oh. But I have no objection to the three you just named. Oh, Silman <laughs> is one of them. Oh, no. No, 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 no you Silman, didn't, you didn't like listen. The first four are so good, I don't know which, which this I I'm sorry, this. which one did you say? But I was I said what I was hearing was Fitzsimmons, Gade, and Gade and Nielsen, but um, I, I that may not be the case. We we talked about Wait. Silman. I had Silman, Fitzsimmons, Gade as my top three. I want to make sure that I heard Councilor Weiner correctly. Silman. No, I had not initially said Silman, but but what what, na what name did you say then? I said Fitzsimmons. I was hearing. Oh, from, from okay. People. Um, Gade, and then it seemed it sounds as if sort of the differences between Nielsen and Silliman, which which of those for the number three for the number three because it sounded oh. like most people were interested in Fitzsimmons and Gade. Yeah. For for what it's worth, as the mayor said uh, earlier in the meeting, I have a loud voice, so I think I'm the only one who's actually been bringing up Fitzsimmons. I don't know if there's been head nods or or not, um, but given that. Um, Silman has come up for several, you know, I don't have a problem with that. Again, this has been an embarrassment of riches and it's wonderful and there will be other opportunities. So I don't have a problem with. Um... Oh, I was going to bring up Ed Simmons. You just beat me to it. Okay. So, <laughs> um, but I, I hear somebody say that between kind of Nielsen and Silman. Is that, well, now I'm sort of hearing awesome. more of Fitzsimmons, Gade, Gade and Silliman. <coughs> Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm okay with either one of these. Laura, you said that was your number one pick. What was? Would, I, had, I had Silman, Fitzsimmons, Gade. If I had, if I had to rank them, that's yeah. the one, which I tried to make myself do. Uh, I would agree with those three. All right. So I do hear a shift to Fitzsimmons, Gade, and Silman. Yep. All right, majority for those, all right. So, could I get a motion to appoint Elizabeth Fitzsimmons, Jamie Gade, and Michelle Silman? So moved. That could Taylor. All right, moved by Burgess, seconded by Taylor. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Item number 14C is Human Rights Commission. Human Rights Commission, there are three vacancies to fill a three-year term, January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2024. And council discussion. I just had a quick question for Kelly. Uh, how does uh, 14C affect 14D with the gender balance? Um, well, when we did the cover sheet, for, for both, they're identical. So it's mm -hmm, right. one female, two male, and one none. So that that balances out if you appoint all four people. So the three full terms and then the one unexpired. Okay. I think you could probably look at it all together and just decide who you're gonna oh, okay. the Oh, okay. Which, yeah. one, which one of them would yep. be the unexpired one? Okay, yeah. I see, okay. So maybe I'll read um, the next one as well because I think that might be helpful for us to discuss all at once. So 14D is Human Rights Commission. Human Rights Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2024. So we'll talk about the three vacancies to fill a three-year term and then the one vacancy to fill an unexpired term and we'll have to determine um, who takes what. Now the one that is unexpired, do we know what that gender the woman who um, stepped in. Right, yes, it is. I, yeah. I think Kelly said it doesn't matter. It doesn't right? matter but who yeah, we pick as long as, as, long as yeah. the requirement. As long as the group is. Group. We're fine. Three female, one male. <coughs> All right, great. <coughs> I'll echo what, what's been said. I don't remember if it was Councillor Weiner or, <coughs> or Harpson who commented on the number of qualified individuals. It just. <laughs> I, I, it never ceases to amaze me here recently the number of uh, passionate, qualified individuals uh, that that have been applying for for these boards and commissions, uh, and their willingness to serve their their community in, in this manner. Uh, it, it's quite obvious that they they aren't applying just on a whim. They they really really want to do this. So uh, I just wanted to make that comment. Um, and I guess on that note, uh, I think there was, uh, as far as the mail, one of the males, uh, Mark Prees, uh, has fin just finished his first term, I believe. 
and I, I think you know this this particular commission I think has a big learning curve when it comes to uh, some of the grants and things that they uh, that they make. I know some some of my fellow commissioners or council members uh, like to spread the wealth as far as uh, membership on these, but but I think it would be invaluable to to keep him on for another term. I did have um, two that I wanted to throw out there. <clears throat> Suyan Channon um, is one, and the other is uh, Badri Kuk, uh, Kuku. Um, and if you read on both of them, they have huge community ties that I think really speaks to um, representing uh, various people um, that the Human Rights Commission deals with, and I would just throw their names out there for consideration. I don't know if others were contacted, but TJ Dido Norris contacted me, and I was very, very impressed with the conversation that we had, so I'd recommend them. Yes, I can support TJ. I would throw uh, Kieran Patel's name out in there, into the mix. Kieran Patel. Th thank you, Councillor uh, Harmson. I, I had her name checked too. Uh, I know her through through other things, and I know her to be a very responsible person, very dedicated. And if she sets her mind to something, or if she has an assignment, she she's very dedicated to whatever she she does. And uh, I know she probably wasn't on other people's radar. So I I appreciate you bringing her name up, Sean. The the two two others that really stood out to me were, um, and I may not be pronouncing it, but it was wife Wifag. Mohammed and Janavi Pandya. And then jo Jonavi. Yeah. All right. Oh, Janavi. John v. I think it may be John V. Any other names people want to throw out? Um, Ahmed Ismail. Yeah. Yep. Just expand All right. So we have a lot of names out here today. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> um, I think, you know, maybe we go through, I'll read the names really quickly while people try to determine uh, where their support wants to be. Um, off all of the one names that's been submitted, although I would agree there are a lot of great people here. Um, so I'll just read the names and then we'll go back through and then um, I'll just ask for people to uh, where your support is. So we have one female, Suyan Cannon, one female, uh, TJ um, Deck, I don't know how to do Norris. Did do Norris, one male. Ahmed Ishmael, Amel Badri Kuku, female Wafang Mohammed, female Janavi, Janavi Padia, female Kiran Patel, and the last one I have is uh, Amel Mark Priest. <laughs> So we have a requirement for two males. So maybe I'll start with the males first. So we have, I count three males. Um, it's Ahmad Ismail and Badri Kuku and then Mark Priest. So we'll start with the um, Ahmed Ismail. So um, how many people support? Thank you. I support him. I support him as well. And I can support him. So we have that as um, majority. And then we'll go down to Badre Kuku. And I support him. Support him. I support him. I do as well. 
okay. and support him. He actually um, attempted to reach out to me just as council was uh, beginning, so I was not able to talk to him. But in and of itself, I know that the, the fact that you know there are people who are reaching out um, you know, shows initiative. So, and I was I liked what he had written in his application. So we won't go to Mark under the um, mail, but we do have one non, and so we'll throw Mark in that category, okay? So we'll start with the females. Um, now there are two, five females that we have listed. So I'll just go through their names, uh, first names. <laughs> Suyan TJ, with Fang, Janavi, and Karan. So we'll go to Suyan, and I support Suyan. Now that we've narrowed it down, would it be, make sense to chat about since we have a larger number to help us I guess we have an opportunity to either um, choose I mean we can throw Mark Priest in this unless um, well, I'd like your idea of keeping him because we have two male one has to be female one can be is anything. none mm -hmm. so I think maybe maybe do this one first and then um, and then we can do well I don't I don't care it doesn't matter to me we need ranked choice voting. <laughs> there we go. Um, like, I support uh, Su Yun, but my number one was TJ. So I sort of have one and two with TJ and Su Yun. So, in a way, since Mark Priest is the only one <coughs> left, naturally, if he's selected, he's going to be out of the none. Mm hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. he, would, so, he, would, he would absorb that spot. And I think that that works really quite nicely because he can help, as, as Pauline said, and actually very um, convincingly, it's like it, this can help sort of with continuity and transition, um, you know, and help, help people kind of get on board. I, I'm a huge Mark Priest fan, and I think that we have so many, and at the same time, my view is that we have so many really well-qualified people who always come forward with human rights that, that I'm gonna have, I'm, as much as I, I have love Mark Priest, I'm probably, I'm not gonna support him because I think we need to give some of these other folks a chance. Yeah, I, and I love Mark Priest as well. I think he has done an outstanding job with the Human Rights Commission. Um, very dedicated, always in attendance, on time, on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, but we have been faced with a lot of applicants, great applicants. This is a highly desired commission. Um, and I think we've made some hard decisions before. I re I'll just bring up um, <laughs> V was one of the ones oh, that, yeah. you know, we, we absolutely would, would have, have loved to obtain them. Um, on a commission, but it was a hard decision that this council made and, um, you know, look at them now. So always a hard thing, but um, absolutely love Mark Priest, but I won't uh, support but with all of these great applicants. I, I, I can understand what all of you are saying, but I would caution you to realize that it's a total of four people and it would be a total of four brand new people on this, this very, I think, stressful uh, wonderful commission but four new people on there that's, that's a big learning curve how many total are on the commission nine, nine. okay thank you for yeah. so I still stand for Mark Preece okay all right so for the nun position sure nun. sure all right so we'll go through people say where they are and then we'll add up at the end so we'll go with Suyan Cannon um, so I support Suyan, and I guess we get two votes. How about that? Did we get two votes? Okay. Sure. Then yes, I'll go with her as well. Okay. Yes. So I hear three. Um, yes. Yep. Okay. So I hear. I'll support her. So I hear six. <laughs> All right. So we're down to one other vote, um, and it can be a non since we already 
did the female. So TJ, and I support TJ. I support TJ. They're really amazing, you guys. Just so you know. <laughs> Leave you. Okay. We will move to Wifang. Really long narrative, just hard to imagine. I mean, it's hard to imagine what everything that she's been through and to get where she is. It just seemed to me like she, she would, when I looked at her and the, and the one who came immediately after her in alph alphabetical order, that they both have a, norm, a tremendous amount to offer. I just I don't even at this point know how to choose between them. Okay. We all have one more vote. Well, wait a minute. I used up my. <laughs> I guess if if it didn't pass, we have one more. If this is why we need ranked choice. Yeah. We need to go back through. <laughs> so if. Well, all right. We'll see where we end up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Janavi. I think she would be my other choice. Uh, if it's like, it's like if I. Uh, supported um, Suyun. I think I would support Janavi. Sort of this co combination at only about 25 service to refugees and immigrants, volunteers with the Native American population, um, anti racism advisor, psychologist, Hindu, sort of a, 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 a mix of stuff that I don't think that I've ever seen together in one person, which is what impressed me so much. So I guess the, the, yeah. so I guess the question is. <laughs> Since TJ didn't move forward, can we now vote again, or or is it possible so. that it no one like, would get four? I think you can just move move it forward, so we can vote. I don't know why not. Otherwise, it's going to be down to one and one and one, or something like that. So. Well, I can I can support. Um, Janavi. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Me too. So I hear a majority. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So for now, let's determine who will get the shorter term. Do we flip a coin? <laughs> Do we? <laughs> How about? Um, I mean, council's practice is, has often been if someone serves a partial term, then we'll consider them attempt. So it's almost an advantage to have a partial term. Because usually, um, in the past at least, we've, if someone wanted to continue to serve. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're looking for some rationale, what do we, um, uh, Johnny is a PhD student which indicates to me that they might, I don't know where they are in their program, but they potentially, and this is a grasping at straws for just some sort of a rationale, <laughs> right? Potentially would be, you know, if they're, if, if they're not done with their program and wanted to continue on, that'd be fantastic, but they also might have a, you know, be at a that's point in their program where they'd be looking, I mean, again, that's, this is. That, that's fine, I mean, I think we, we literally yeah. just sort of like threw a, threw a coin up yeah. in there. Sounds good to me. All right, Yeah. okay. All right, we're good. All right, so for the Human Rights Commission, the three vacancies to fill a three-year term, we will have Suyan. Could I get a motion for um, to appoint Suyan Cannon, Ahmad Ismail, and Badri Kuku? And then for the one year, I'm sorry, for the one vacancy for an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2024, I also will need a motion to appoint, uh, and you said it better than I did. Janavi Pandya. Janavi Pandya. Yeah. Can I get a motion please to appoint them as mentioned? So moved, alter. <laughs> Moved by Alter, seconded by Armson. Armson? 
Okay. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion, motion passes six to zero. 14E, Parks and Rec Commission. Parks and Recreation Commission, two vacancies to fill a four-year term, January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2026. Um, council discussion. I will point out that, um, I mean, this is another one where there's a lot of, a lot of great applicants. Mm -hmm. yep. um, Rachel McPherson, um, one, she's a phenomenal person and has a lot of, um, um, I think she can contribute a lot to this commission, but I also wanted to point out that, her, uh, and this isn't giving her any um, advantage here, but McPherson Park, um, that is James McPherson Park, that's her father. Um, she was very involved um, with a lot of the things that took for uh, that took place with the renaming of that park. Um, I think she'll be a great candidate um, for this park. And while I'm also just throwing out names, I will just throw out uh, Dolores Mixon. I, you know, looked at her application. Um, what we're used to seeing on applications, hers just didn't actually have. So um, I've talked to her uh, about her application. She called, and I think she called um, the majority of us, if not mm -hmm. all of us. Um, and I think she would also be a great person to be on, the co on this commission. Other names? I agree with you as well, Mayor, um, but I would also, just to sort of throw out uh, another name for just to talk over, if nothing else, to say, wow, this is a really interesting individual is Aaron uh, Broage, or Broge. And I believe that he came up before us uh, in an earlier cycle of Parks and Rec. And um, this may not be his cycle either, but I just, I think, ooh, he has uh, a lot of interesting experience that that would be very suitable. So, just to make it so that it, you know, because we didn't have enough to talk about in the last commission, so I just thought I would bring that up. And the gender balance requirement here is one female and one non. Right. Any other names to throw out? The, other, the only other name I throw out sort of for consideration is sort of bringing somewhat into the fold is Karen Crane. I was also considering her. She seemed to have a really good understanding of the commission. Okay. Any other names? So we have four names three females and one male. So maybe we'll start with the non first and then see where we end up. Well, I think we can probably just go through all the names and see where we end up. So Aaron Broge. Karen Crane. And I guess I'm looking for people that support. Oh. oh. So I'll go through all the names. I'll go through. Let me go through all four names one more time. All right. I'll go through all four names one more time. Um, so Aaron Broge, Karen Crane, Rachel McPherson, Dolores Mixon. So we only get two votes. So Aaron Broge. Mayor, would it make more sense to go ask each of us what our top two are? Oh, that works. It's only four, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll start on the, well, we're going to start with you. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> and then we're going to you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I would say Rachel McPherson and Karen Crane. All right. And I'll go out of order and say I agree. And I will also say uh, those are my top two Crane. And I like your argument about McPherson. It's, that's kind of interesting. Nice connection there. So uh, Crane and, and McPherson for me. 
Your idea just went down the drain, <laughs> but all right. All right, so, I tried. <laughs> you didn't try. follow the rules. <laughs> all right. I, I would have gone with uh, McPherson and, and, and Mixon. Okay. So overlap, but not exactly the same. Okay. And ultimately, that's who I would have or will support, I guess, or so my choices were, were the same as Sean's. All right, so McPherson, I, I support, so that makes it. Um, Mixon, I have, so that's three. And then it's three for Karen Crane. And we're kind of, so, um, which is, is narrowed down. So I guess the question is, where do we want to be? So anyone willing to flop? I'll, I'll tell you that, the, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel strongly, but the, the main reason that I put forward Karen Crane is because of um, of all the, the folks who, who have been dealing with the, the swimming and the pools and so forth um, in discussions with her and also seeing her outside in the community, I'm uh, really able to to talk with her and, and, and have conversations, and I thought it would be really good to have somebody who uh, seemed, could, could have those conversations as part of the process. And that was why I um, was interested in her. But the that was also why I was interested in her. But I don't know, because she had so little, and I did not end up talking to her, I don't know anything about Dolores Mixon, because there was very, there was really yeah. I guess from that same vantage point, that was partially, I know Dolores, and I mean, she will throw all in to, you know, get involved and to, understand what's going on, but uh, it, she also has a voice um, and uh, some experience um, throughout the city um, in, in groups that, that typically Parks and Rec doesn't really reach. So um, uh, that's part of the reason why I think that her interest is really important in her voice. I'll switch to Dolores. Okay. Um, so we have a switch to Dolores, which um, that's the majority there. Yep. So for Parks and Rec Commission, could I get a motion to appoint Rachel McPherson and Dolores Mixon? So moved, Harmson. Second, Weiner. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. We are on to Public Art Advisory Committee, um, item number 14F. Public Art Advisory Committee, one vacancy to fill a three-year term, January 1st, 2023, through December 31st, 2025. Council discussion. There's only one, it had to be a female, and the only person uh, of the two um, who was also well-qualified. Yes. yes. Going to serve again is Andrea Truitt. Yep. Yep, I agree. And it's fantastic. And, and this is one of those examples where there's, they served um, an unexpired term, or they took over a term. Um, so this would be an opportunity for a full term, which council typically has leaned towards, but not all the time. So I can support it. And it sounds like majority is there. So mm -hmm. can I get a motion to appoint Andrew Truitt to the Public Art Advisory Committee? So moved. Second. Moved by Taylor, seconded by Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Item number 15 is announcements of vacancies new. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Senior Center Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2023. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. Could I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved. Second. Moved by Burgess, seconded by aye. Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Item number 16 is announcements of vacancies previous. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Historic Preservation Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. And that's for East College Street. Historic Preservation Commission, Woodlawn Avenue, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Housing and Community Development Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. 
Library Board of Trustees, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Airport Zoning Commission, Iowa City Representative, one vacancy to fill a six-year term. Board of Appeal, Board, Board of Appeals, HBA representative or qualified by experience or mm -hmm. training, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Board of Appeals licensed plumber, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Senior Center Commission, two vacancies to fill a three-year term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. Item number 17 is City Council information. Yeah, I had the, um, the the great pleasure of attending the the Iowa National Guard's um, sort of civilian leadership day this this morning. Um, really learned a tremendous about about the National Guard, the huge amount actually of federal funding that comes into it. Uh, the that they don't just work overseas, but when they they were instrumental in helping out, and particularly in Cedar Rapids after the derecho, clearing roads so that then the, to allow the utility companies to get in afterwards. Um, and I think the piece that many of us may not r realize is how much work they did um, during COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, there it was their headquarters in Des Moines that was ended up used was used as the command center, including for the governor. They were busy transporting tests all the way by air all the way from Sioux City to the hygienic lab in Coralville. Um, they were they they actually did a huge amount of work in COVID. So re really helpful um, and informative session. Great. I'd, I'd like to remind uh, folks that this Thursday, the 17th, is the Employee Appreciation Lunch uh, from 11 to 1 at Terry Trude Blood Recreation Area. Uh, I hope to see uh, many of our city employees there. It's always been very enjoyable to do that, and we've kind of had uh, a few years not doing it. Um, uh, so each and each and every one of you employees, those that are listening and, and then hear this broadcast, you. Uh, you play uh, a valuable part in the city's ability to provide necessary services to the community, and I look forward to seeing uh, as many as I can uh, this Thursday. And uh, just a quick note, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, mention that it's my granddaughter's birthday, eight-year-old birthday, and so happy birthday to her. I don't know if she's watching, but save me a piece of cake. All right. <laughs> uh, well, last Thursday on the 10th, uh, there was the Better Together uh, 2030, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the event, where they gave out the Bravo and Sizzle Awards. That was just a really, really good event, really good time. And a number of city employees and community um, leaders and volunteers who were recognized there. So it's just exciting to see the work that so many put into Project Better Together that came out of COVID um, moving forward and really uh, keeping energy going. So. On Friday, there was the truth giving at the Englert um, and that was put on by Great Plains Action Society, which is the executive director is Sakawas Novus, mm -hmm. um, who was on our um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, this was a, a really a great organized event. Um, there are people from out of the state that came in to share um, some stories, but the music was phenomenal. Um, uh, people were dancing the night away, and so was I. It was a, it was a lot of uh, it was a great time of uh, both uh, history telling as well as um, um, enjoying some of the uh, tribal music. All right, no other comments? Looking above to the voice in the air. <laughs> Our Mayor Pro Tem. All right, uh, we'll go on to item number 18, which was a report on items from city staff. We'll start with our city manager's office. Nothing tonight, Mayor. City attorney's office. Uh, one brief housekeeping matter, uh, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> you may recall that at your last meeting, you deferred the UI Labor Center agreement to this meeting. There were some kind of late breaking uh, requested changes, and so as a result, we weren't ready to bring it forth uh, today. Uh, we hope to have it for you at your December 6th meeting. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. City clerk. Nothing from us. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Item number 19 is adjournment. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. 
Moved by Taylor, seconded by Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. We are adjourned.